The history of the 20th century would show how Marx's answer to these problems went catastrophically wrong. Private property, money, the profit motive, and alienation would seem to be fundamental to our present stage of evolution. We make use of them as they make use of us. Alienation becomes heightened individuality. On the other hand, Marx's analysis reaches far beyond the early Victorian society to which it was applied. His description of money worship, our attitude to private property, consumerism, and the pursuit of profit for its own sake are all too relevant to the age of downsizing, provoked currency crises, rocketing technology stocks based on unreal values, and companies whose assets consist of everything except the people who work in them. All this is analysed in much greater detail in Marx's massive masterwork *Das Kapital*, *Capital*, the first volume of which he published in 1867. Alas, Marx's finest work is also his most unreadable. A typical sentence chosen at random: "The progress of accumulation lessens the relative magnitude of the variable part of capital, therefore, but this by no means excludes the possibility of a rise in its absolute magnitude." The first volume continues like this for well over a thousand tightly packed pages, with two volumes to follow. It famously prompted the British Prime Minister Harold Wilson, who is generally recognised as having gained the finest economics degree ever at Oxford, to state flatly, "I have never read Marx," an astonishing, if understandable, omission. As an economic analyst, Marx is equalled only by Adam Smith and Keynes. Das Kapital investigates the mechanisms of economics against the background of mid-nineteenth-century Britain. This was the most advanced industrial economy in the world, and appeared to indicate the future. Both in capacity and efficiency, British industry far outstripped its competitors. An indication of the full extent of British supremacy is given by the following figures, which Marx quoted with regard to the cotton industry. In England, the average number of spindles per factory was twelve thousand six hundred, whereas its two main industrial rivals, France and Prussia, could manage only one thousand five hundred spindles per factory. The full magnitude of this advantage becomes clear when we learn that the average number of spindles that could be maintained by one worker was seventy-four in Britain, but in Prussia just thirty-seven, and in France only fourteen. The cost of labor and the cost of the product were similarly affected. Yet, despite this vast supremacy, the British workers' conditions were appalling. A poor law doctor in Bradford made a list, included in full in Das Kapital, which showed that his patients were living, on average, a dozen to a room, with some more than twice this. A street with more than two hundred houses was likely to have fewer than forty primitive outside lavatories. Those who lived under these conditions worked long and hard. A skilled factory hand in Northern Ireland was required to work from 6 a.m. until 11 p.m. Monday through Friday, stopping at 6 p.m. on Saturdays. For this work, I get 10 shillings and sixpence, 53 pence a week. The worker explained to the visiting factory inspector. All the statistics that Marx collected were from the official reports in the British Museum. The capitalist system freely provided the evidence against itself—a suitably dialectic process. Marx also pointed out that previous economic theory proceeds from the fact of private property; it does not explain it. Private property was not a permanent feature, as any glance at history would show. In the beginning, there had been tribal property; next, ancient communal or state property. Then feudal or estate property, conferring social status on its owners. Thence had come the bourgeois notion of private property. But what underlay all this social development? As we have seen, Marx viewed history as a succession of class struggles. In ancient society, the slave class struggled against the free men. Later, the Roman plebeians struggled against the patricians. Then the serfs against their lords. The medieval journeymen against the guild masters. Oppressor and oppressed stood in constant opposition to one another, an uninterrupted fight, now hidden, now open, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large, or in the common ruin of the contending classes. Historical progress marched in a dialectical fashion. Each phase developed its own contradictions, which eventually resulted in the progressive synthesis of a new social system.
Capitalism was simply another phase in this inevitable historic progress. As capitalism developed, it too generated its own inherent contradictions. A free market led to an increase in competition. In order to increase efficiency and profits for his business, the bourgeois capitalist invested in machinery. Small businesses that couldn't afford such capital investment were driven to the wall. This intensifying competition led to larger and larger enterprises dominating the market, until eventually a monopoly was established. Hence, competition led to the contradiction of a monopoly. At the same time, the introduction of machinery meant increasing unemployment. But this served to diminish the market. The unemployed had no wages to spend on the greater numbers of goods being produced by this increased efficiency. More goods, declining market, decreasing profits. Thus, further contradictions within the system emerged. If, on the other hand, there was a boom which resulted in full employment, the workers' wages were bound to rise according to the law of supply and demand. There would be no pool of unemployed who could be drawn upon to work for lower wages. Higher wages would eat into profits. Either way, the capitalists' profits would inevitably dwindle. These internal pressures arose within capitalism as a result of its own development. The result was a series of recurrent and ever deepening crises. These would eventually lead to the final crisis, which would bring about the collapse of the capitalist system. According to Marx, capitalism was basically unjust. It relied upon the exploitation of the workers because the capitalists owned the means of production, the machinery, the tools, and so forth. A cotton bale arrived at the factory door and left as garments which could be sold for a higher price. In this way, the worker in the factory added value to the goods, but he was not paid the full value he had added. In fact, he was paid a subsistence wage or little more. The factory owner pocketed the surplus value as profit. This, according to Marx, was exploitation. Marx was a firm believer in the labor theory of value. A product had a real value which could be calculated according to the amount of labor that had gone into its production. When machinery entered the equation, it was valued according to the amount of labor that had gone into its production. Such a theory has all the appearance of justice. Unfortunately, it is at odds with the circumstances in which it is applied. Namely, the marketplace. The amount of labor used in making an article is highly likely to affect its price. One would expect a car to cost more than a bowl of rice, but in free trade, the market is the ultimate arbiter. Supply and demand will always override labor cost. In the midst of a famine, a bowl of rice may even fetch more than a car. Similarly, Marx's analysis of the manufacturing process severely misjudges the role of the capitalist. He risks his money when he sets up the enterprise in the first place, and for this he requires a reward to make his investment worthwhile. This is the driving force of capitalism: enterprise, imagination, risk. Economic motives are, for the most part, the acceptable face of avarice. No one embarks upon an enterprise if there is no possibility of gain, and the only prospect is the risk of loss. Such is human nature. The domineering and exploitative behavior of the capitalist class, the demonized bourgeoisie in Victorian Britain, was often grotesque. Likewise, their attitude to the hideous poverty they inflicted on the proletariat. Good day to you, Mr. Engels. As history has shown, however, it was largely the people who ran the system and the freedom they were allowed, rather than the system itself, that was at fault. Unchecked power has always been a recipe for exploitation and hypocrisy. The capitalist system itself is only partly to blame. Capitalism seems to resemble Churchill's democracy, the worst form of government except all the other forms that have been tried. What was required to aid the victims of capitalism was government intervention rather than the radical alternative that Marx proposed. In his view, the balance of social and economic justice could only be redressed when the means of production were taken over by the state. Such forms of bourgeois private property should be nationalized. This is precisely what happened in the Soviet Union and throughout the communist world. Free enterprise was stifled in favor of state planning, the five-year plan, the great leap forward, and the like. Under favorable conditions, this may appear all very rational and just, but human evolution, either social or individual, has at best only aspired to reason and justice rather than embodied these qualities.
A controlled economy may attempt the occasional great leap forward, but it is unlikely to create a Silicon Valley. Such leaps spring from the intoxication of individual imagination rather than from sober committees. Even so, elements of Marx's critique of capitalism still have relevance. Many of these elements we choose to ignore. We prefer our own working-class heroes to the Stakhanovite versions depicted six times life-size, bearing red banners in socialist, realist. Part of capital, therefore, but this by no means excludes the possibility of a rise in its absolute magnitude. The first volume continues like this for well over a thousand tightly packed pages, with two volumes to follow. It famously prompted the British Prime Minister Harold Wilson, who is generally recognised as having gained the finest economics degree ever at Oxford, to state flatly, "I have never read." All this is analysed in much greater detail in Marx's massive masterwork *Das Kapital*, *Capital*, the first volume of which he published in 1867. Alas, Marx's finest work is also his most unreadable. A typical sentence chosen at random: "The progress of accumulation lessens the relative magnitude of the very red Marx." An astonishing, if understandable, omission. As an economic analyst, Marx is equalled only by Adam Smith and Keynes. Das Kapital investigates the mechanisms of economics against the background of mid-nineteenth-century Britain. This was the most advanced industrial economy in the world, and appeared to indicate the future, both in capacity and if. The history of the twentieth century would show how Marx's answer to these problems went catastrophically wrong. Private property, money. The profit motive and alienation would seem to be fundamental to our present stage of evolution. We make use of them as they make use of us. Alienation becomes heightened individuality. On the other hand, Marx's analysis reaches far beyond the early Victorian society to which it was applied. His description of money worship, our attitude to private property, consumerism, and the pursuit of profit for its own sake, are all too relevant to the age of downsizing, provoked currency crises, rocketing technology stocks based on unreal values, and companies whose assets consist of everything except the people who work in them.